Hello, I'm Therese. Welcome to Spirit of the Rainbow. This is one of a series of videos on Cathars, and this one is about women Cathar priests. For my part, my background is in publishing, but I've always been interested in exploring spirituality and in particular, womankind's search for a spiritual voice. Today, we'll be talking with Simonon Honoré, an historian and author. Welcome, Simonon. Hello. Simonon, firstly, could you explain the origin of women Cathar priests? So we need to go right back to the time of Jesus, really. If we look at the Gospel of Philip, that's one of the Gospels that didn't make it into the official Christian Bible. We can see here the fact that Jesus was always with three women, his mother, his aunt, and Mary Magdalene. And they formed a kind of inner circle around him. So right from the beginning, women had an important part. And we know that the early followers of Jesus, and there were many different strands and groups, and we can see in this picture, one of them were the Gnostics. And in some of their meetings, women officiated. Now here we have the outrage comments of a conservative uh, Christian commentator, Tertullian, um, noting the fact that women were in positions of spiritual authority. Now, funnily enough, there's a parallel with the early Islamic movement, and you'll see here a short poem or saying by Rabia al Adawiya. Now, she was a woman Muslim mystic uh, who lived in the 8th century and who was very revered in the way that she showed the pathway people could follow to God. Indeed, she's revered today. But what seems to have happened both in the early Christian movement and in the early Islamic movement is that after a while, the sort of dead hand of patriarchy made itself felt and women were increasingly suppressed. So that when we come to the Middle Ages and to Cathar women priests, what we're seeing here is not some innovation, but rather a rejuvenation, a resurgence of the original intention. Indeed, so so the, the women Cathars were in a sense following in the footsteps of the early tradition of the Christian church. And so interesting to hear that there was a similar uh, tradition in, in Islam. So um, in that context then, what was a woman Cathar priest? Well, the first thing I should say is that they weren't Cathars and they weren't priests. That's to say, they weren't called Cathars in, at that time. They were called the good Christians, good women, good men. We use the word priests because it's roughly equivalent uh, to the position of an initiated Cathar that was called a parfait, somebody who had been perfected. But as we shall see, there was much more to them than, than the priesthood as we might understand it in the modern Christian church. What we find is that being a parfait was a commitment to living the example of Jesus as his apostles. It was a life without material wealth. It was life of simplicity, of teaching, of healing. Uh, it was a life in which you made sacrifices, they didn't eat meat or poultry for reasons I shall explain later. Uh, they wore a simple dark robe. And even the process of becoming an initiated Cathar, a parfait, required a two year probationary period. Normally, it was either uh, women 
who hadn't yet been married or women whose husbands had died, which incidentally was relatively common, partly because women last longer than men on the whole, and partly because when women did get married, they're quite often uh, younger than their husbands. So when the woman was unattached, then uh, if she was called to being a parfait, then she would uh, go through a, a ritual. Um, so being a Cathar priest or parfait was a serious lifelong commitment with many sacrifices. Indeed. Uh, so, yeah, that was sounds as if it's a really quite simple, austere, almost ascetic sort of life. Um, and yet they were, they were able, they, they were women who were able to be part of that kind of community in another sort of a way. So how did they then become parfaits? So they went through a ritual called the consolamentum. And this is something we know about because it's one of the few written sources the Cathars have left us. Most of what we know or think we know about the Cathars was written by hostile Catholic sources. But this, we have the original document. In fact, we have two versions of it, one in Latin, one in, in their native language of Occitan. Both women and men could go through the consolamentum. And as we'll see, it's much more than a simple initiation into priesthood. First of all, the idea behind it, and it was often called a baptism in spirit, really came from the understanding that the soul, whose natural resting place was in the heavens, had become trapped on earth through a series of cycles of reincarnation. They were trapped in the bodies of women, in the bodies of men, and even in the bodies of warm-blooded mammals, which is incidentally why they didn't eat them. And when the soul was ready for the final stage, to become a parfait then, they would go through this ritual of the consolamentum. And once they'd been through it, when the parfait eventually died, the soul would then return to, to heaven. Now, the ritual is set out as a formal dialogue between the woman Cathar, uh, who wanted to be initiated, and an uh, elder. And as we both have copies of the consolamentum, I thought it might be interesting to get a flavour of the ritual by reading a short extract in Great. which... The woman Cathar, um, who was about to be initiated, interacts with the elder. Well, perhaps if I could take the part of the initiate and uh, you the elder, would that be an I'd idea? I'd definitely do elder, yeah, do that. Here we go. Okay. So, if we imagine it's it's you that is being initiated, the elder would say, Therese, you wish to receive the spiritual baptism by which the Holy Spirit is given in the Church of God, preserved from the apostles until this time, and it has been passed from good men to good men until the present moment. I promise to give myself to God and the gospel, never to lie or swear, never again to touch a man, to kill no animal and to eat neither meat nor eggs nor milk and to live entirely on vegetables and fish. And finally, never to betray my faith before any threat of death whatsoever. Holy Father, receive thy servant into thy righteousness and put thy grace and Holy Spirit upon her. And then the 
uh, New Testament would be placed on your head and the other women other women Cathars would place their hands on you and there you would be uh, 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 initiated, uh, perfected, and your soul would be free to return to the heavens once you'd passed on. But I, I love the fact that it's such a simple ceremony and so basic, so unlike the kind of Catholic tradition where, you know, you had robes and incense and all sorts of high ceremony. This was a, a simple, a simple, a, a solemn oath. Yeah. Um, so you, you mentioned that um, the, the Cathars were subject to a whole lot of censure, but uh, what day to day um, would they have had to do, the woman Cathars? So the first and most important thing, being Cathar Parfait was about living the life, not following a doctrine. So they needed to become living examples in the footsteps of Jesus uh, and his apostles. Now, as we can see here from the uh, text, one of the important ways they spread the word uh, was to the network of Cathars. First of all, down the generations, so grandmother, mother, daughter, but then across different families. So we have um, Blanca of Lorac, for example. She marries the local lord. When he dies, uh, she sets up Cathar uh, House, organizes meetings, debates, and indeed in Lorac, Cathars lived uh, openly. And then her daughter, essentially did the same thing. She married uh, the Lord of Lavore, And uh, as this outraged uh, Catholic chronicler says, she became the lady of the lady of the town and an utter heretic. Uh, she unfortunately came to rather a sticky end. Most uh, initiated Cathars, most Parfait lived in single sex communities. They worked, they were known as weavers. Many of them developed medical skills. And we can see this in the extract from Pierre Etienne to the uh, Inquisition, that uh, people would visit the Cathars to get uh, medical help. It was very common to find that in inquisitorial records. They were preaching. And here we see an example again from inquisitorial records uh, of uh, one of the most outstanding um, of the uh, Cathar uh, women who, in fact, quite apart from her formal position, um, dominated uh, the uh, Cathar movement. This is Esclamant de Foix. And we can see here the Catholic Bishop of Toulouse being outraged by it. And then uh, they also held rituals and meetings. We've already looked at the Consolamentum. There's the blessing of bread, which we should look, on, look at on video free. Uh, we have a special Cathar greeting. We have a confession, which was unlike the confession in the Catholic Church, was a public confession, and it wasn't specific to you. It was a general confession of sins. Um, and then we have the kiss of peace, which again, as you can see, is mentioned there, uh, a special kiss of peace that, uh, that, that Cathars uh, had, although there's a version that survives, in, I think, in, in, in modern churches as well. So the life of women parfait was very full, certainly was. I'm interested that they had so much freedom um, within the context of, of a medieval society and women in general were sort of constrained, yet they had that freedom and they could preach. So, uh, yeah, there was still that resistance to led to, to allowing them that, that, that voice. So, Simonon, what challenges did women prophets face from the church? Well, at the beginning of the 13th century, the church launched a crusade, the Albigensian crusade, 
against the Cathars, which lasted 20 years. And even after that, there were individual military campaigns, uh, including the siege of Montségur, which is dealt with in the first video. There were many bloody massacres. Women as well as men uh, were burnt to death, slaughtered. Following the crusade, there was the Inquisition was set up, which aimed to seek out, arrest, bring to trial and punish Cathars. And just to give you an example, we, we have the life story of a Cathar parfait, uh, Arnaud de la Motte. Now, she became a Cathar as a young girl. She was 10 or 11 or something. She went to live in a Cathar house. And then the crusade came along, so it was a life on the run. And she and her companion, which was in her case, her sister, Peron, they had to live in, in various uh, secret hiding places, including a cattle shed for three years. Uh, the persecution grew more intense. And in the end, she decided to try and reconcile herself to the Catholic Church, which she did for a few years, but she always kept in touch with the Cathars. And then at a certain point in her life, I think she was in her sort of late 20s, she decided, no, I, I want to live the life of a Cathar Palfay, knowing all the dangers. So she went back to the Cathars. She had another consolamentum. Uh, her sister died, but she found another companion. And this time they were living pretty much outdoors. And in fact, she was uh, living in a tent in the forest when she eventually was arrested by the agents of the Inquisition. So the life of a parfait was very tough and dangerous. It certainly was. I mean, to have faced such horrors, you know, by the church, um, it must have been, you must have been really committed to have stayed with it. And I mean, as a as somebody who was brought up Catholic, I find that it, it's quite disturbing to think that people were actually put to death in such horrific ways. Um, but were women, Simonon, were they able to, to find their spiritual voices as parfaits? It's a very good question. In theory, uh, women and men were spiritually equal. How far that worked out in practice, we have some kind of idea. We know, for example, the majority of Cathar followers were women. We think about a third of Parfait were women. So that's comparable to the proportion of clergy in the Church of England that are women. Of course, in the Catholic Church and in the Orthodox Christian Church, it's zero. There were no Cathar women bishops. There's no record of deaconesses that's possible that the women who ran Cathar houses were deaconesses. We do have to bear in mind that it's not just the formal structure because there were certainly about half a dozen Cathar women who by virtue of their spiritual standing or social position were immensely influential. I mentioned Esther Mondefoy being one of them. We know that women uh, held consolamentum, though it seems to have been rare. We know that women could and did preach, though possibly less often than men. What we do know is that women were very supportive of each other. Uh, so if somebody was in jail, in the Inquisition, other women would send them food. There's a famous example of the abbot of Sorez, who tried to have two women Cathar arrested, and he sent out one of his henchmen to do so, and the women of the town uh, attacked the henchman with sticks and stones and, and, and beat him away. So the abbot uh, was outraged and uh, tried to remonstrate with the women. They just said, no, 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 you, you've made a mistake. These are perfectly respectable married women. That was that. Um, it's also worth bearing in mind that what was being done here was against very much the social headwinds. You know, the patriarchy was the dominant ideology of the Middle Ages. 
as an example of a Catholic troubadour poet who writes it of a dystopian vision in which there's utter lawlessness, where the qualification to become a leader is disloyalty, and so on and so on and so forth. A whole long list of appalling characteristics. And he adds, women were preaching as if this would be part of the horror that, uh, that faced humanity. So as far as we're able to, to work out, those are the key facts about the position of women. Mm -hmm. So they, I mean, those, those that were able to certainly made their voices heard and uh, others perhaps were more repressed as, as you would expect from that society. So what happened to women parfaits in the end, Simonon? Well, the church pursued this systematic campaign to eliminate every last Cathar. Uh, in the south of France, for example, where they're very strong, the last Cathar was burnt alive in 1321. They hung on a bit longer in Spain and in Italy. But on paper, they were all destroyed. However, the spirit lives on, uh, both in individuals and groups. In the middle of the 17th century, during a time of political turmoil in England, we have the Quaker movement to give her its proper name, the Religious Society of Friends. And this was a very interesting spiritual movement because they believed very much in the inner light, in that of God in every person. And in Quaker meetings then as now, uh, people can speak uh, inspired by the Holy Spirit. And that meant women were literally given a spiritual voice uh, within the Quaker movement. And many of them went on, in fact, to become social reformers. Um, we have a quote here from somebody who was anti-slavery abolitionist and so on. So they were very, very active Quaker women, as indeed they still are. And then we have another route quite outside religion, which is of wise women, healers, cunning folk. We have an example here of Mother Shipton. And really the attraction here, as far as I understand, is that it's a movement where there are virtually no men, no hierarchy, uh, women predominate, and they can express their own spirituality, their own magic on their own terms. And that, of course, has gone on from millennia. And then most recently, we have the emergence of powerful spiritual figures that are women. And uh, I take the example of Mother Mira, who I have been to see. She is a woman of tremendous spiritual power, a very strong, radiant energy surrounds her. Uh, she gives a healing in silence, which is very potent. And I think she's one of an emerging tradition then of women spiritual teachers who, who stand in their own right. So in that respect, I think we can see women Cathar priests as an important step in a very long, too long, a journey for women to find their own spiritual voice. Yes has been a long journey, but in a way from the early Christians to Cathars and then now re-emerging, it's kind of come full circle, which is in a sense really inspiring. So thank you, Simonon, for those insights about women Cathar priests. I think what I take from this is that despite the challenges that women of the time in, in general and women Cathar priests in particular had to face the, the threat of death, the, you know, repression, patriarchal society. What stands out for me, I think, is their courage and the fact that they stu stood together, they, they worked together and 
and that that is that spirit is returning where women can once again embrace their spiritual power and find their spiritual voices so thank you simonon you can find out more about simonon's work by visiting www.spiritoftherainbow.org and there you will also find a link on the home page of spirit of the rainbow their youtube channel where there are more videos about the cathars. Bye for now. Bye.